Well, hi, everyone. Um, we're so honored to welcome you to this kickoff Zoom event with our author, President Emerita of Wellesley College, Diana Chapman Walsh. I'm Nicholas DiSabatino, um, and I'm the head of our author relations here at the MIT Press. I also have the good fortune of being Diana's book publicist, and I'm going to be helping moderate today's Zoom event. Um, so today we're celebrating the release of Diana Chapman Walsh's new MIT Press book, The Claims of Life, a memoir, which is on sale today. And it's available for wherever books are available for sale. We are so excited to be joined today by Biddy Martin, President Emerita of Amherst College, who has kindly agreed to help with moderating the, the chat today as well. President Martin wrote in her lovely endorsement of the book, a remarkably thoughtful and moving account of life, a marriage and a college presidency that identifies the ability to lead oneself as a key to the trustworthy leadership of others. Walsh's story demonstrates curiosity in the face of difference and conflict, courage in the face of opportunity and change, and joy in the success of others. Hmm. About our wonderful author and speaker here, Diana Chapman Walsh is president emerita of Wellesley College and an emerita member of the governing boards of MIT and Amherst College. She was a trustee of the Kaiser Family Foundation, the Institute for Healthcare Improvement and the Mind and Life Institute, and also chaired the Broad Institute's inaugural board and co-founded the Council on the Uncertain Human Future. She is the author, co-author and editor of numerous books, including Corporate Physicians Between Medicine and Management. In his endorsement, Cullen Murphy, the editor-at-large at The Atlantic, writes, at once practical and poetic, inquisitive and deeply personal, Diana Walsh's memoir invites us into the life of one of America's great educators and offers a field manual for effective leadership in an era of social division and institutional mistrust. In an early review, Forbes wrote, warm, tender, and honest, it's a book as much about living a meaningful life as it is about an effective college president. The Claims of Life offers readers an unusually intimate view of trustworthy leadership that begins and ends in self-knowledge. During a transformative 14-year Wellesley presidency, uh, Diana advanced women's authority, compassionate governance, and self-reinvention. After Wellesley, her interest took her to the boards of five national nonprofits galvanizing change. She kept counsel with Nobel laureates, feminist icons, and even the Dalai Lama, seeking solutions to the world's climate crisis. With an ear turned to social issues, the claims of life is an inspiring account of a life lived with humor, insight, and meaning that we know will surely leave a lasting impression on its readers. Diana, congratulations on the release of your book, and welcome to today's event. Thank you so much, Nicholas, for organizing this virtual celebration of the release of my new book. I didn't know there was such a thing. I think maybe you invented it, but, but it's a wonderful <laughs> thing you've done. I appreciate it. I have also the MIT Press to thank for the fact that it is a stunningly beautiful book as an object, a work of art. Truly, I was dazzled when I first held a copy of it in my hands a couple of weeks ago. I still am. And I've been hearing this morning from people who received their pre-order copy. So it's all happening. It's amazing. Of course, I'm hoping that they'll like it. That's the next question. The dream that I might have it within me to write a book that would be beautiful to read has long been with me. I've been a writer all my life of a great variety of academic and policy publications, a few books, hundreds of speeches, reports, even a little poetry. But this yearning to write a beautiful book remained unfulfilled. It was the answer that would surface when I was at some sort of a retreat and asked what one regret might I have on my deathbed for something I hadn't achieved. So these heartening early reviews that you've been reading from have a special resonance for me. I won't say that I can die happy now, but I'll need a new answer to that question of what's still <laughs> missing. Or maybe I can just stop asking the question. Now there's a thought. <laughs> Thank you so much, Diana. Um, before I hand it over to you and Biddy to have a wonderful conversation, I was hoping I could read one of my favorite passages from the book really shortly, and then we're going to have you read a passage as well. Great. Good. So here we go. In one of my favorite passages, you write, I thought about the claims of life, of mine, of anyone's. 
isn't the first claim to find the courage, whatever the cost, to carry on, to reach out and connect with others, to keep reaching out? Aren't we humans here to cultivate a shared sense of purpose, to listen and be changed, to persist no matter how messy the world seems to be, no matter how intractable the problems might appear at any moment, no matter how indeterminate the future might look? Beautiful. Thank you for letting me read that. I'm going to hand it over to you now to read a passage that you've chosen, and then we're going to hand it over to you and Biddy. Great. Thanks so much. So I was glad when you decided, you told me that you'd have me read a little bit. It seems like we ought to give the book a chance to speak for itself as we launch it. It seems only fair after it tolerated a near infant infinite number of assaults as I wrestled the words onto the page, this poor book. But now here it is. So for this reading, I initially thought I might just take a few short samples running through the book for five different places through the narrative. But given what's going on now, as we're also acutely aware on college campuses, I was drawn instead to one selection and it's from chapter five. Uh, the chapter is called the Inbox Exercise. Um, that's a reference to a skill that's needed by new leaders when they're beset by multiple challenges, the ability to discern very quickly which emergency to address first. That decision wasn't too subtle in my case <clears throat> because I walked into a very hot controversy that was already unfolded. In fact, while I was in conversation with the presidential search committee over the summer, a tenured full professor, his name was Tony Martin, in our Africana Studies Department was writing what turned out to be a crude anti-Semitic book. It came out just months after I arrived and I had to decide what to say about it and how. The chapter tells that story. It was easier in those days before social media became such a radicalizing force as it is now, but it was far from easy then. And this passage comes about 10 pages um, into the chapter. So picking up kind of in the middle, I'm, I'm, I write this. We owed it to ourselves and to our students, I repeated often through the crisis, to meet the conceptual challenges embedded in the controversy. My problem was the, that the controversy was such a Rorschach test that everyone I consulted had different notions about the learning we ought to extract from it. Some wanted to organize courses or symposia on the origins of modern slavery and the conditions that produce it. Others had felt strongly for a long time that we weren't providing our students the intellectual and interpersonal tools they needed to resolve their differences. They believed a better understanding of the causes, effects, and manifestations of racial and religious intolerance might augment students' skills. Still others thought the answer was more exposure to the history of US civil rights and liberation movements. Behind some of the differences were unspoken territorial disputes among departments, especially in the social science disciplines, each of which could claim special expertise in issues of race and class and power. Added to this were tensions between the faculty and the staff over who was ultimately responsible for student life. And then I skip a little bit. We had a strategy. The strategy was simple. We would expose what we saw as reckless and harmful in Tony Martin's writings, isolate him and diminish his impact on campus, and I hoped eventually in wider academic circles. We would counter his divisive rhetoric with educational initiatives. Individual professors who taught in subject areas that shed light on the controversy found ways to work lessons from it into courses they were teaching. Two young faculty members, a male sociologist and a female art historian, teamed up to design and offer a new course on propaganda and persuasion. And then skipping again a little bit. The most dramatic healing event occurred the following fall in November, 1994, when Elie Wiesel came to speak at the invitation of student leaders of Hillel. I was with the student who had brought me this dream of hers the previous spring. She saw it through with determination and with a committee that invited Professor Wiesel lined up 24 departmental and organizational co-sponsors and spread the word. Our largest auditorium was fuller than I could remember it, alive with anticipation. She and I escorted our guest out onto the stage. The hall felt totally silent. We made brief introductions and our guest walked slowly to the podium. Rizel stood there, expressionless, as the applause died down. His deeply creased face was a familiar symbol of sorrow and transcendence, but his presence was much more than that in this collective silence. 
He sighed and drew a deep breath, leaned forward into the microphone. I know why I am here. He paused again. The crowd held itself in total stillness as if the slightest movement would break a sacred connection. Then he began his lecture. And after those first six words made no further reference to the controversy that was tearing our campus apart. Instead, he gave us stories that honored how hard it is, how heartbreaking, how unlikely to work in every possible way to build a moral society, yet how urgent it is that each of us do so. We all know, he said, that there are no victors in wars, that the people only lose, that everyone loses. How can we build a moral society when we know how fragile the structure of our survival is? Indifference to evil is evil and sometimes worse than evil. The opposite of love is not hate, but indifference. There is no alternative to humanity except humanity. A community striving to be moral, he taught us that evening, lives in dialogue, honors the humanity of all its members and recognizes that any one of us can at times wear the mantle of learner, teacher, witness. And that closes his quote. We left the auditorium that night, I felt, on our way to becoming a healthier community. I spent another restless night in the president's house wondering where I would find the courage and the leadership cunning to enact Elie Wiesel's vision for Wellesley when a noisy squadron of Canada geese out on the lake announced the approach of dawn, I still had more questions than answers. Could we really parry hate mongering by investing in making peace? If I could resist the seduction of throwing my energy into opposing the haters, might that undermine their ability to set the terms of the engagement? Would this help break the fruitless cycles of blaming and name calling? Could I craft the tools to lead the college on beyond this debilitating pattern that I now saw had been recurring for some time? My best hope, it seemed to me, resided in the higher values of peace and human dignity, Elie Wiesel so fully embodied for us that night. And they were the values I knew had called me back to my alma mater to see if I could fashion myself into the leader it needed now. I hoped I would weather the storms if I could remain focused on the possibility of an educational community that protects individual freedom, expects personal responsibility, and somehow manages to foster an overriding concern for the learning and well being of everyone here. Thank you. Very powerful. Thank you so much for reading that wonderful passage. Welcome. We are going to transition now into having you and Biddy chat a little bit. Um, and then we will allow for time around 15 uh, minutes before the end of the hour for questions from the audience. I'm going to put some more information in the chat about how you can submit your question. And I'm also happy to um, call on folks at the appropriate time. So, but I'm gonna pass it over to uh, Biddy. It's over to you. Thank you so much for being here. We're so grateful. I'm honored to be here. Congratulations, Diana. Thank you. Um, by the way, speaking of humanity, you're the first person I've ever heard personify a book and have compassion for it. Your, your book. <laughs> well, it did suffer. <laughs> it went through a long process. <laughs> I'm not sure it suffered, but in any case, it's so Diana that you would think of the book and its well-being. <laughs> <laughs> Diana, let's start at the beginning, uh, but there's never a beginning, so I understand that. <laughs> Tell me how you came to the decision to write a memoir? Well, it goes way back. So I'll go way back for a minute. Stop me if I'm going too far back. When I was 12 years old, <laughs> I wrote well, stories for my younger sister, Sally, who was uh, an avid reader and cheered me on. I felt like Dickens turning out installments for a hungry Victorian readership. She just couldn't wait for the next, <laughs> the next few pages. My mother typed them. Sally and I lost interest in our project, but I continued to write and kept journal through all my life. It's from those notebooks and computer files that I was able to reconstruct the story in retrospect. When I arrived at Wellesley <clears throat> as a student, we all took freshman English. We called it freshman then. My professor sat cross-legged on the desk, he was new that year, I think, and declared that the study of English literature was the surest route to understanding the human condition. So I was hooked. I majored in English, read and relished much of the traditional literary can canon uh, that was taught in the 60s. It changed a lot after that. 
and paid special attention always to the cadences of the words on the page. I heard them and I often memorized sequences that I especially loved. After graduation and a first job, I went back to graduate school for a master's in journalism, still thinking I'd be a writer. I won a prize for my thesis, but I wasn't able to land a newspaper job. There weren't many women, many of those jobs for women in those days. So I took a detour into other kinds of work that I describe in the book, a very long detour that culminated in the presidency of Wellesley College for 14 years. So I started writing the memoir, this book, for which I have such empathy, <laughs> right after I left the presidency in June 2007, 16 years ago. I joined a writing group and completed a beginning draft of a book on what I'd learned about leadership. That was really what it was to be in my mind, a very first draft. And I put it aside as various diversions surfaced and these were enticing new claims on my life. <clears throat> so it's been a long gestation period, maybe something, <laughs> Nicholas is just back from, from South Africa, something like giving birth to an elephant or maybe a herd of elephants. It was the COVID shutdown that turned the tide for me. My husband, Chris, who's always been a, an amazing scrivener, was writing one scientific tome after another. He wrote, and I tallied this up because I couldn't quite believe it. He wrote some 2,800 published pages in five massive monographs that came out between 2020 and 2023, if you can imagine. Somebody asked, did you ever see him? I did, but mostly <laughs> attached to his computer. So it was then that I settled down to my writing. Was it competition or self-defense or sheer desperation? I don't know. In any case, I finally did get the job done, a book very different from the one I set out to write all those years earlier. Along the way, I was supported by people I acknowledge in the epilogue and by many other dear friends to whom I'll always be grateful. A lot of them are here. I can see them on the screen. Thank you. Diana, the claims of life is, is a guide, I think, among other things, to what you call trustworthy leadership. And I think what a leadership book it is. You articulate five commitments or sets of guides to what you believe trustworthy leadership entails. You Will you outline those for the group? Sure. It, it, they, they evolved too through the Wellesley years. I didn't, I didn't have them in hand when I walked in the door. <clears throat> I had, I, of course, lots of ideas about the kind of leader I wanted to try to be. And I'd been through a Kellogg National Fellowship in which we actually studied leadership, but these these evolved and they were really mine and they evolved out of the interactions on campus. Um, and the question I was asking myself all along was, what would it take for me to be a leader who's worthy of trust? The idea of being trustworthy was important to me. So first I knew I needed to question myself. I needed to be in to attuned to an inner truth that I could return to reliably. I had a friend named Parker Palmer who wrote a very influential essay called Leading From Within. So I needed that, I needed to lead from within. But at the same time, I also had to be open to the influence of others. Second, I knew I couldn't possibly possess all the answers because I had only one perspective. That's why I needed to be open to influence. But it was also why I needed to establish partnerships as the basic units for accomplishing work. I really uh, invested real thought into the integrity of those partnerships. I would sit down with a new partner and we'd sit down and talk about what we would be doing together and how we wanted to do it. <clears throat> and um, I, the integrity of them was very important. And I wove them into networks of leadership teams. And we'd come back after, you know, if there'd been some sort of rupture, as there often is. One of the things I learned was when leaders are trying to change something within the organization and they're coming in as a united front, the system, sort of reifying the system, resists that by trying to split the leaders off from each other. So you need to keep coming back and checking in and seeing whether what you're hearing is true and, and what's really happening. Third, I tried consciously to resist the use of force, except as a last resort. Now I grew up a Quaker, so maybe that's where that came from, but it's more than that here. I found myself frequently called to exert my power on one side or another of high stakes dispute. People would get really stuck. They were, when they were really, really stuck, 
You, this happened to you too, I'm sure, Kitty. They came to the president. Okay, who wins, who loses here? When I refused to just decide who wins, who loses, it was painful because I often then look like a weak or indecisive leader. And that's a judgment our culture is very quick to apply, but that's a trap because it's even more discouraging to see disputes smolder and reignite in cycles of repetition and escalation, which is what we're seeing now, sadly. So I focused on trying to create conditions in which the conflicts could be explored and transformed at the most local level, where those people who are most directly involved could assume responsibility and discover their own resourcefulness. Now, often that meant I needed to send some support their way because they we're stuck. We had to help them try to find their way out of it, but not, not to make the decision from on high. The fourth isn't quite as elaborate as that one. <laughs> the fourth was one that we all know is so important, and that is that it's clear it was clear that valuing differences was not only an ethical imperative and a measure of respect, although certainly those things, but also was a unique creative resource. I learned repeatedly that the voices from the margins often held the buried wisdom that could alert me to myself, deceptions could alert all of us. And then fifth and finally, I worked to cultivate communities as systems of mutual support. I saw leadership as a collective project that found its authority, but also its joy in a set of commitments and values that we spoke of frequently, that we, find, that we refined together and tested, that we advanced as best we could, and then looked back to take stock together at how well we had done. So in the book, I tell stories that illustrate each of those principles. I made sure towards the end, there was at least one story for each of them, but not, I hope, in a heavy-handed way. It's They're woven through the narrative, and then they're summarized in an appendix at the end for readers who might want to find them of use. And the, and the summaries are somewhat more elaborate from what I've just said here. And I hope they will be helpful to some leaders and maybe not only in academia. That's my hope. There's no way they won't be helpful. <laughs> uh, first of all, I've never read accounts of leadership in higher ed at the level of detail you achieved. And only someone who kept notebooks of this work <laughs> you did would be able to recall with with the accuracy and, and imagination that you present. Uh, and um, I'm going to jump in. I have, a, I have a story about the notebooks. I can't resist. Okay. Uh, hold Go. your question for a minute. So I had two board chairs and they were both fabulous. And one of them is on the call. I saw her when I just uh, logged on, Vicki Hergett. My first board chair was chaired the search committee and brought me and was very invested in my success at the beginning. And it was not a foregone conclusion. So she was fabulous and important, Gail Clapper. She was a lawyer and she saw me making those notes and she said, ooh, 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 ooh be careful. <laughs> those could be discoverable. Yeah. So I was sort of careful about what I wrote down, but I still wrote that all down. And Vicki, when she came along some years later, bought me a beautiful red leather notebook cover to carry around with me as I was making my notes. So that was the two different approaches of the two board chairs, but um, they're still in my basement here. And, and uh, I think pretty soon they may have to go somewhere. I think <laughs> the general councils of many of our colleges and universities would, would today <laughs> want to go down into your basement or anyone else's and, and get those. Um, yep. <laughs> Diana, you know that I love uh, the passages in which you talk about being uh, that that you talk about trustworthy leadership depending on being able to lead oneself. And when I read that for the first time, I both felt intuitively like I understood what you were saying, but I also wanted to be able at that moment to reach across uh, the country <laughs> and say <laughs> and ask you and and you know, give as brief an answer as you want. What what do you mean by that? How would you articulate what that means? The the ability to to provide trustworthy leadership is dependent on being able to lead oneself. I'm sure that's correct, <laughs> and yet it's it's just such it's a fundamental core of right. the book right. that you've written. How so it's you it? <clears throat> so it is this idea of leading from within, and I did. I did arrive at Wellesley with that firmly in my 
head. Yeah. The idea of leading from an, in, and if, if you didn't, if you weren't questioning yourself, if you weren't paying attention to your impact on other people, if you're the leader, especially of a large organization, you have an impact on a whole lot of people. And if you're allowing yourself, your, you know, your mood, your biases, whatever, to kind of leak out and affect what you're doing, what you're saying, you're doing real harm. And so to be really tuned into that and tuned into sort of who am I? What am I bringing? What can I bring? How am I showing up in situations? Am I showing up with compassion and with understanding, with an open mind and willingness to hear the complexity of what people are bringing? Um, and that was also the joy of it for me. That was really what fed me was the ability and the chance to be doing that with people. So I, when I was getting ready to show up at Wellesley, it was the summer before and I was on Cape Cod and I was learning to rollerblade. Somebody gave me rollerblades and I was rollerblading up and down that Cape Cod Canal, trying not to fall down, which was, I wasn't so good. But um, I, I, without meaning to, I developed a mantra and I, this is not part of anything formal, but, but just all the things I was afraid I might not do well. And, and so it, it was simple. It was just be tough, be clear. Be honest, be fair, be true to yourself and keep your own counsel. And keeping your own counsel was, you know, I'm going to be in the middle of all kinds of juicy stuff and I better be very careful that I'm not carrying it from one person to the next in ways that are harmful to anybody. But all of those, honest, fair, true to yourself. So that was, so, so that's really what it was about for me. And it, it's very much embodied in that first principle of uh, questioning yourself. Yeah. Beautiful. Um, you actually had two stints at Wellesley as, as a student and <laughs> as Wellesley's president. Right. And so I'd love for you to talk about, especially right now with all of the doubters uh, about the value of uh, uh, an education of the sort Wellesley provides and Amherst and many others. What would you say um, Wellesley did, Diana, to shape this incredible life you've had so intellectually mm -hmm. stimulating so rich um and then i'll want to know about your achievements at wellesley but first okay. you know what did wellesley do at what does college at the quality of a wellesley what does it do to provide that possibility uh, right it it opened you know it's so hard not to for it not to be cliches and people have written so <laughs> from so many years so beautifully about a liberal education and what's at, at stake and it's about living the questions and all of this I, so I'll just be personal you know I arrived as a first year student convinced that I wasn't especially smart the sister of mine <laughs> to whom I read my writings for a little while um, Sally this wonderful sister of mine was brilliant. She was really, you know, off the charts. We went to the same school and, they, you know, she was always, they always wanted to skip her ahead pretty soon. She was going to be in my class, but my mother wouldn't let them do it. Her mind was filled with information at ready recall. She was at home in the world of time and space and numbers in a way that I never have been, never will be. My mother always quoted back to me, the, my report card from nursery school, it said, Diana um, is getting along nicely with the other girls, but she's not well-oriented in time and space. And my mother was like, where on earth is she? Oh my God. When I got my driver's license, she said, will we ever see you again? So, you know, I sort of felt like my brain was pretty good, but really nothing like Sally's. And then I married a man whose brain was even more amazing. So what was that about? But in my four years as a Wellesley undergraduate, surrounded by these brilliant faculty and students, I decided that I wanted to be an intellectual. I wanted to live, live a life of the mind. I wanted to dwell in that world. And that wasn't the world that I had grown up in. I was involved in a lot of sports and other things. And we were not a family that was raising up the life of the mind. And I didn't really know what it mean. But I learned that if I worked hard, I could do that. And I could hold my own in such a world. And that belief really changed my life. Mm. We were both athletes and that that actually helps develop certain it's characteristics true. too, doesn't it? Yeah. Okay, talk a little about your what what you would say now are your proudest achievements as the uh, president of Wellesley. Well, the first one is that I did make myself into a leader, one who was trusted at least most of the time. I'll say most of the time. There were moments, there were no guarantees, as I said at the outset, that I would succeed at that. 
I tell the story in the book. I love the story of the day Chris, my husband, arrived home with an unexpected offering from a fancy gift shop in town in the t- fancy town of Wellesley. It was all wrapped up. And I opened it. It was a quirky lamp that was shaped like a dog. It was sort of strange. I didn't know why I needed it or why he bought it. I said, what is this? Puzzled. And it turned out he'd figure out, figured out that this was the day on which I had survived on the job longer than the shortest serving president in the history of the college. So that. <laughs> <laughs> so who was counting? Well, Chris was, I guess. Was. So I got past that milestone and I survived and even succeeded, as we now know, luckily, with the benefit of hindsight. And that's because I led several amazing teams over those 14 years and they got a whole lot done. So my underlying achievement, as I understand it, was the way those teams came together and performed at a very high level. My cabinet several cabinets along with faculty and administrators and trustees and student leaders and alumni who stepped up at various times when they were needed. And there's a long list of what we actually accomplished and I don't need to belabor that here. It's also heartening to me to see some of the seeds that we planted way back then, as I said, 18 years ago, bearing fruit now and exciting initiatives that Wellesley's magnificent current president, Paul Johnson is stewarding and reshaping now. I was on the phone with her only yesterday and she was talking about a couple of things that we started wondering about before I left. So so that's been good. And then there was one other thing about that, that I think is a, was a contribution and it's more ephemeral and certainly not easily documented. But it's this, that I, I loved Wellesley College as a student and as a president, I still love it from a distance. Wellesley made me who I am, not once, but twice. <laughs> I admire so much of what it stand for, stands for, as Vidi, these values that it upholds and represents, as we know Amherst does too. I, I love Amherst too. And yet there were things about the culture then at Wellesley that troubled me. There were habits I believe were holding the college back, a perfectionism, an air of constant judgment, a fear of making mistakes, a harshness to the criticism of others and of self, especially of self. Habits that I believed impeded learning, at least for some students and myself included when I'd been one. I said this to a new trustee, a professional consultant in a breakfast early in my presidency. He was CEO of the fabled Boston Consulting Group. And he asked me what I wanted to be remembered for, what I wanted to accomplish and be remembered for. And I I said essentially what I just said now, something like that about the culture. And he said, be careful. Culture is notoriously resistant to change. And yet by the end, I was sure that we had changed the culture slowly and with persistence during those years before and after the turn of the millennium. It was quite an amazing time, a period of time in 9-11. We made the college tougher and wiser and kinder. I'm sure of that. And I, as the leader, changed in those directions too. We confronted and valued our differences in new and deeper ways. We learned from them and emphasized the satisfactions of learning for its own sake, the joy of stretching to expand and take in something entirely new. We emphasized that strongly. The poet William Butler Yeats famously wrote of education, we've all heard this quotation many times, that it's not the filling of a pail, but the lighting of a fire. I think we invented some very special new containers in which the college continues to light and tend those fires of learning. And when I go back, it's always just a joy to see that there. It's a continuity through time. I'm sure you see that too, Biddy, when you go back to Amherst and we'll continue to do that. I hope I do too. (laughs) (laughs) Diana, thank you. Listen, um, speaking of wisdom and kindness, it's impossible to go through a uh, discussion of your book without having you say at least a little bit about your interviewing and your relationship with the Dalai Lama. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was sitting exactly right here. I realized when I set myself up here for this call <clears throat> for the interview with the Dalai Lama and Greta Thunberg, that was quite something. So how did that come to be? You might ask. I yes. asked myself that. So I, it, while I was at Wellesley, I became known as a college president who had gone out on a limb with my strong support of a multi-faith program that defined education as a spiritual journey, not just an intellectual one. And 
you know, I got some skeptical looks on that sometimes on the campus, but I, but I was supporting the program. I believed in it. I believed in what we were doing. Victor Kazanshin was a wonderful leader of that program. And so I came to know outside educators who shared that view. And after I left Wellesley, was invited by one of them to join the board of an organization called the Mind and Life Institute, which, which was co-founded by the Dalai Lama in 1991 to foster dialogue between East and West. And he has always been deeply committed to this particular organization. Of course, there are hundreds, maybe even thousands of organizations that bear his name all over the world. But this is, this is the one for him. This is the one he really pays attention to. And so <clears throat> I had many close encounters with him over a five-year period across the U.S. and two in India, where I co-moderated the dialogues, the week-long dialogues that, that he has with scientists and philosophers from all over the world. And we often discuss what he calls secular education, and that's the teaching of reverence and compassion for all living beings. He believes that we humans will need to cultivate that consciousness and soon, if we are to preserve what he refers to as our only home. I agree with him. Mm -hmm. That was the context in which I hosted his conversation with Greta Thunberg, which drew something like a million viewers, they told us, eager to hear the urgent messages of these two iconic figures. And it was quite a show, clearly quite a privilege, one of, one of many in my life, and I'm grateful for all of them. So many privileges that came to me as a consequence of being selected to run Wellesley College. Yeah. Thank you. Diana, one of the, uh, one of, as you know, one of the things about your book that I loved is your, your marriage <laughs> and uh, the way uh, that you and Chris lived these extraordinarily lives, extraordinary lives together. And I think most of people on the call, but probably not all, know that one of the claims life has made on you mm -hmm. is loss, the loss of Chris and the grief uh, that comes with it. I just wonder if you'd like to say anything about Chris and the relationship and what it has meant to you and continues to mean to you. Thank you. Well, the, of course, losing him is just unimaginably painful still. But um, the, the, the amazing thing, and it kind of happened organically as things do. So the, 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 the leadership book in the beginning didn't, didn't, Chris wasn't in it very much. In fact, I remember I met someone who'd written a couple of biographies out here, a real writer, a wonderful person. And I had you know, what I'd written and I sent her some of it. And she said, well, you do write well, but well, where's Chris? Didn't when were you married then? Where he's not, he's not in this book. Didn't you ever ask him any questions? Or, so it wasn't, you know, I, I had been writing my leadership book. And then as it evolved, we were out here together. We'd uprooted ourselves from everything we knew on the East Coast to be near our daughter. That was a huge decision. And so here we were, the two of us, and we were making new friends. And, and I was missing our old friends terribly and uh, going back a lot. And he was here. And and we we were with friends who were and we were aging and so we're friends are talking about life and and you know beginnings and endings and all of that and and going deeper and deeper with some some dear new friends out here and i was writing and he was writing and as i said during covid in, <laughs> in self defense as he's writing these poems I'm tempted to walk you out into his study and show you these books that take a whole long shelf. Um, I started to write my memoir and it suddenly became really, or gradually became clear to me that of course it was our story. It wasn't just my story. It was our life story. And I, I'd worked with a, a wonderful writing coach who'd suggested, uh, it, it, she, she was sort of being a reader for me and telling me what was working, what wasn't, not really editing, but um, she suggested that I start the book with, with, she asked me what was the hardest thing I'd done at Wellesley. And it was that it was the weekend that my husband had uh, had quintuple bypass operation during commencement. And I had to run back and forth and Amherst shows up in that. And because I started out in Amherst and he goes to the hospital. Anyway, it was, it was really hard and he survived, thank God, and had wonderful years after that. Um, but, but we decided to put it at the beginning of the book. So the book opens 
and I'm sitting at his hospital bed. And so it draws the reader in. She was, this coach was all about drawing the reader in. She was also all about making sure that I didn't disappear. You know, I was used to doing academic writing. She kept saying to me, wait, you've disappeared. You've just described some other person, but wait, you're not here. We don't, we're not caring about your book anymore. Once you go away, we don't, we don't care about it in the least. So that was mostly what she did for me, which was really helpful. So there I was sitting next to his bed and then just the most poignant, unbelievable synchronicity, parallelism. We were together in for Christmas with our kids as we do in Cabo in Mexico. He was reading the final page proofs of the fourth book in a series of four on periodic elements in the periodic table. Somebody said any self-respecting element on a periodic table had better hide because Chris Walsh is coming after them, but he didn't get them all. Anyway, he finished that book and um, had the page proof so he couldn't change it. And I had the edited proof. So I was kind of futzing around with things because I always do and I can never let it go. And we came home and his book went to press and um, it we came home on New Year's Eve and he fell on January 3rd. So then my page proofs came that can't be changed. And the question was, I mean, among other things, can I even stand to look at them? But I did. And um, what do we tell the readers? Because by then he was, he was in it. We were, you know, there was a point when I wasn't sure I wanted to marry him. And he said the most beautiful, beautiful things. <laughs> and, and they're in the book. I had to, you know, I had to dig them out of him while he was writing his tomes. What did you say then? And he, so it's his words, it's words. And he was, I was writing chapters and I, of this sort of new edited book and I was showing them to him and he'd come back. Sometimes he'd come back, he'd walk around the corner right here, right here and he'd have tears in his eyes because he just read a chapter about something we'd done together. So uh, I'm gonna get teary myself, but that experience, I mean, what couple get, has that opportunity? We lived, our, we lived our whole lives together through that book, through the writing of that book, and then he died. I mean, it was weird and painful and beautiful, beautiful that we had that time. I never forget how grateful I am for that. There was nothing left unsaid. Diana, you're remarkable. You, mm. you are. I, I love you so much. <laughs> I love do you. you so want much. To, do you want to end by just telling us what you hope people will take away from the book? Ah, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a very good question. So, I think I, I think the first thing is. And, and Allison doesn't ever want to do any administration. Allison is my daughter, by the way. She's in the book, too. And she's a wonderful oncologist doing very well, full professor at Stanford. And they keep asking her to run things. And she said, no, 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 I'm not running anything. No, no, no. My parents did that. I'm not running. So, um, so the first thing is that leading, that leading a complex organization, leading anything is never easy. But taking on those challenges to lead affords an unparalleled opportunity to learn and to grow. So stepping up to leadership pays off, even though it's hard. If I'd known how hard it was going to be when I accepted the job, I might not have had the nerve to take it on. And that really, really have been a pity because I emerged from, as I've said, many different ways this morning from the presidency, wiser, more resilient, happier. It's not morning, it's afternoon where everybody is. Um, and I believe I even emerged a more loving person from that 12 years at Wellesley than I would otherwise have been. So I encourage leadership. Secondly, I hope I've left readers with some concrete ideas about to, how to meet the tough challenges and they are tough the challenges that organizations throw at the boss. And that's the trustworthy leadership part. Third, I hope, and this is something that you've already implied that readers may take away a deeper appreciation for a distinctly American institution that has a major role to play in our democracy in the future as it has in the past as we face looming challenges ahead, these liberal arts colleges and universities with the liberal arts colleges embedded in them are needed now more than ever. We need to honor them, even as we ask more of them and the national trust and belief in higher education has, as you know, been declining alarmingly. 
But like our nation, they are never without their many quarrels, nor are they free of, nor are they free of flaws, but they work at working. They adapt and they learn and they assemble diverse voices to reason together. They bend mind and heart to their work and they insist on mutual respect and the pursuit of truth. And that's what they're doing now as best they can in a very, very challenging time. Open minds and open hearts, the Dalai Lama likes to say. He says it all the time with a broad smile and sometimes with a giggle. He giggles a whole lot. He's a joyful being. And we need that too, if we're going to find our way forward at this perilous time on our planet. So I see a central role for education, and I hope my readers will too. Well said, Diana. And thank you, Biddy. I'm going to just jump in. Um, thank you so much for this spirited and warm and lovely conversation. Um, we're at the point of our talk right now where we're going to switch over to q and I put some directions in the chat. You can also uh, message me directly as well. I'm also happy to do the old fashioned uh, raise your hand and I'll call on you. Um, I've got a couple questions now I'm going to ask to Diana if that's okay with everyone. Um, so Diana, um, our first question comes from Susie Moser. Um, yeah. Dear Diana, what is one or are several fires you didn't light and regret not to have lit while at Wellesley? How come? Thank you. Ah, that's a good one. I don't think, and it happened as soon as I left, so it was pent up. I don't think I did as much with gender and all of the ways in which gender was going to be changing, challenging as I should have. I could have been much better attuned to that than I was. And um, again, I, I, it became a very, very important focus in the years after I left. And I think that was probably because I wasn't on it and tuned into it well enough during my time there. And it's amazing. Oh, there was a there was a moment. I even <laughs> we, the seven college presidents, the seven sisters, the seven college presidents would meet once a year. And the president of Barnard was uh, an anthropologist, Julia Shapiro. She was wonderful. She was hosting that year, and she said, "Well, I think we ought to talk about this whole transgender trend." And this was before it was a trend at all. I mean, she was really looking into the future, and she said, "I think that should be the subject of our meeting because I'm an anthropologist." And I said. <laughs> shame on me. I said, well, I'm an epidemiologist and I don't think it's a, an important enough issue for us right now. And I was wrong because it was coming. Yeah, thank you for sharing that answer. Um, the next question I have is from uh, Jane Ariser. And if I say anyone's last name incorrectly, I apologize. Um, what advice, tips or techniques would you provide a presidential search committee to find or recruit a compassionate, wise, and loving president? That's a good question. Ah, Jane, it's Risser, and I know her, and she's wonderful. <clears throat> Wellesley alum, hi, Jane. So the presidential search committee that found that found me was marvelous. And I do, there's a whole chapter on it. And it was, at one point, it was much longer than I was got way carried away with all the nitty gritty details. But they were really good. And the reason they were really good is they really, really, really got to know me and I them. And by the time I describe it in the book, there was this, there were these two moments in which in, in during my wealthy years in which I experienced myself in a social field, people, you know, sociologists and others talk about the social field, generative social field, a social field that is sort of larger than the people in it in a way it has its own kind of wisdom and 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 tone and tenor and the, at the end of the interview the final interview with the presidential search, search committee that happened something just shifted in the room and we all sat there knowing this is it they were supposed to bring three candidates back and they only brought me back and that took some finesse because <laughs> they trotted me around as a leading candidate when they didn't have any others 
but um, but they but they got they really got to know me and I got to know them and I got to know myself more deeply. So the process had a tremendous integrity, and that was because they were very hands on. I mean, they this committee it represented all the different constituencies. They worked very very hard together, and they themselves did all the reference calls, and so they really really got to know me. So that's what I would recommend. And do people ask me? <laughs> Thank you. Um, our next question is from Alice, who is a Wellesley alum from 2001. Um, Diana, you established the Religious and Spiritual Life Program in your tenure at Wellesley. Do you yourself have a religious faith? Oh. So could you share what it is? That's a great question. So I actually have to be fair and say I didn't establish it. It was established the year before I arrived. Peter Gomes was a Wellesley trustee. He was the Christopher Sh uh, Plummer, professor of Christian morals at Harvard. <laughs> Funny title, I always love that title. And head of the Harvard Chapel. And, and um, he and Nan Cohan, my predecessor as president, created this multi-faith service uh, pr program, wonderful program. I, I was lucky to walk in on it, but I, as I said, I really did, did hold it up and, and supported it very strongly. Do I, my faith. So I, I grew up in the Quaker tradition. I went to friends meeting as a child. I, it, I have a very um, nuanced understanding of silences. I think it's almost as Eskimos do of snow. I'm very conscious of silences and I need them and appreciate them. Um, and in more recent years, when we moved out here, I checked out the Quaker meeting and I've been going to a, a meditation center. I went after I had joined the Mind and Life Institute, I, of course, was exposed to all kinds of fascinating people who brought all kinds of mostly Tibetan Buddhist, but other meditation practices back to this country when they'd gone off as, as young people and found it in the, in the East. So it's, a, it's a, a kind of a mixture, but it's mostly about sitting quietly and breathing and resting my mind or trying to and seeing whether I can find that space of awareness that is just so delicious. I love that. Thank you for that generous answer. Um, our next question comes from Kurt Newton. What mm -hmm. emerging project or challenge most holds your attention and pulls you in now? Well, it's for quite a while. Uh, it's been it's been what's happening with the climate. Uh, I've been extremely drawn to that from the time I left Wellesley. And that's that wasn't something I particularly focused on at Wellesley either. Although in the book, as I as I wrote it, I realized there are threads that run through an early, early position in Planned Parenthood, an early flight over the, <laughs> the Amazon basin with the president of the University of the Amazonas and things of that nature. So I, so I certainly was concerned about it. And I spent my summers in a beautiful, beautiful place in the woods on a lake. And so I loved nature. So I'm very, I'm very, very focused on the climate crisis emergency, which it clearly is, and have been, and was the co-founder with Sarah Bowie, who's a wonderful Wellesley alum, five years behind me, of an organization we call the Council on the Uncertain Human Future, which is a, a group that brings people together in, in circles um, using the way of council, which is a particular dialogue form that enables you to speak quite deeply from the heart into the circle and, and to listen extremely deeply. And we've been doing that in many settings, including in higher education. We've done a, quite a bit of it at MIT. I think 700 people, I think that's the right number, have been through these councils and it's part of their MIT's 10-year climate action plan. And very different, you know, MIT's the place where engineering is done and they're the ones probably who among a handful of institutions might be able to come up with some important engineering technological solutions to this crisis and they're working at it very hard but also uh, we've sat with them in these circles and really gone deeply into questions about how will we have to change and what's coming and how do we understand that and who who do we need to be as we face into it and they are they're hard questions, but they're important that we address them. And it's very hard to do that alone. So it's wonderful to have small groups in which you can be very honest about your concerns and your fears and, and come out of it with 
connections and understandings that there are things we can do together that can make a that can make a difference and we can be there for each other through whatever it is that we will face in the future. That's great. Um, this next question is very fun. Um, it's from uh, Laura Hess Fisher. Mm -hmm. Are there one to three pieces of media, books, poems, et cetera, that deeply influenced or impacted you in your leadership that you can recommend in addition to your own book? Hmm. Uh, media. So, so I read a lot, as I said, I had this Kellogg fellowship and it was about leadership. It was a three year fellowship. We read all manner of things. Um, and uh, so, and uh, this essay by Parker Palmer, Leading from Within, that had a big influence. I mentioned that before. Um, I, you know, I think it's, in the Kellogg Fellowship, we did, they they set up these programs for us. We had, we, we had, we, we had seven seminars that they ran over a three-year period. And they'd start out and we'd be met by leaders we'd, in some city. We'd move into some city, there'd be a theme. It would be education or it would be the environment. Or we, John Denver sang to us when we got to Denver. Uh, it was that kind of a, an organization that had a lot of money to throw at us. But it was the it was those experiences. So we, we, we got a chance to see the issues in a broad way. And then we went and visited people on the ground who were doing important work, small pieces of a larger puzzle, but who were doing it and doing it beautifully. And um, I, I met someone who's been a dear friend my whole life since then. I met, mentioned her in the book, a woman named Billy Avery, who founded the National, it was then the National Black Women's Health Project, now the um, Black Women's Health Imperative, just had its 40th anniversary. So I think the the that, that combination of, of wrapping your head around a a big issue, reading what you can, putting it all together, and then making sure you expose yourself to, to people who are doing creative, intriguing, interesting things on the ground, making change, making things happen, and and asking them to, to, to teach you, okay, how are you doing this? And there was a moment at the, at the meeting, the first time I went to the, uh, and met Billy's organization, one of the speakers was about mutual support of women. And one of the speakers was there to speak to us. And we were these delegation of people from, you know, from universities and whatnot. And the speaker got a little nervous and was having trouble. And one of the other members just stood up, uh, members of the organization stood up and just quietly put her arm around the speaker, didn't say a word. Nobody said a word. She just stood there with her arm around the speaker who then was able to go on and I never forgot that. That was such a beautiful gesture. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, we're getting close to the end of our talk today, but I think we have time for maybe one or two more questions here. Um, we might just go a minute or so over if that's okay. Um, this is a really good question from Catherine Grace. What gives you hope at this perilous moment for the world? Oh my goodness. Yeah, right, right, right. So... <laughs> I ended my book. That was one of the questions was, was how to end this book. I have, the, we moved out, Chris and I moved out here because we have only one grandchild. We had only one daughter and she had only one son. So we have one, only one grandchild. That's how it happens. And we love him dearly, of course. Um, so I end my book with with him at the end. I'm, I'm writing letters and notes trying to get people to go out and vote. <laughs> and I have two different versions of this. One of them sent something you could print out on your computer and just sign it. And then another one had little postcards you could write. And I was wondering which was more effective. And so um, I I asked him, I said, I've been writing these postcards by hand and, and then these form letters. And it said November, I, the, by hand one said, no, November 8th is your last chance to make chance to make your voice heard. In this important election, I wrote in part, will you please join me as a voter? I'm a volunteer in my late 70s, and you are a young voter. We need you now. And Sean said, Sean, my grandson said, go with that one. He said it was certainty, and he took out his phone, took a picture of it. So the book ends. I did. I did go with that one. And I placed my faith in this new generation, trusting them to learn and to lead. And I have tremendous faith in them. And I also have tre tremendous faith in the leaders of this world of higher education, who I believe are going to create environments within which 
these youngsters are going to come up and through and become more like the vision the Dalai Lama has for this human species that we are more compassionate, more engaged. I believe that. I hope it and I believe it. That's wonderful. And I think that might be a good uh, stopping point for us today. Um, this went by very quickly. Um, before we uh, leave, I want to just thank everyone so much for your time and your consideration. Diana, thank you so, so much. Congratulations again on the release of your wonderful new book. Biddy, thank you so, so much for joining Diana in conversation. And all of you, we're so grateful and honored that you joined us today. Um, I've put some more information about how you can find a copy of The Claims of Life, a memoir, at the MIT Press website. You can support your own local independent bookstore or your own um, book selling option of choice. Um, and this will be recorded to watch at a later time. Um, so stay tuned for that. Um, and yeah, we are so grateful for all of you um, for being here and joining us celebrate Diana and this wonderful, wonderful book. So thank you. Thank you, Nicholas, so much. And thank you, Biddy. And thank you, everyone, for coming. I sent you all emails. I sent a lot of emails, and I felt a little silly doing it. But thank you for coming. <laughs> I'm grateful. We're grateful for you. Well, on that note, um, we wish everyone well, stay safe, and um, the claims of life is available now. <laughs>